men say they'll try to stop the blacking of newspapers critical of them, but no change in the rail strikes. A Scottish woman's bringing her own case of rape against three youths the Crown didn't prosecute. And an airliner in its wrong element, 200 people waded to safety, but still don't know why they landed up in a harbour. Two ASLEF officials have given an undertaking at the High Court that they'll speak out at a union meeting tomorrow against the blacking of the Sun newspaper. On Friday, the Sun reported allegations of fiddles over railway work rotors, and since then, railmen at King's Cross Station have refused to handle the paper or any of the others owned by Rupert Murdoch. Today, his firm took the two union officials to court, but no injunction was granted. And at a hearing in Chambers, Mr Justice Glidewell is said to have described described the blacking as a natural human reaction, though he warned the men against taking the law into their own hands. Julian O'Halloran was at the High Court. The hearing at the law courts attracted supporters of the two Aslef men from the King's Cross branch of the Union. The judge said in the same circumstances he too would have been angry about the Sun report. But though no injunction was granted in the end to the newspapers involved, their representatives were satisfied with the outcome. Undertakings had been given by the two Aslef men that they would request their colleagues to lift the blacking and a British Rail observer would be at that meeting. We've agreed to take uh, notice of the undertakings we've given today. That will be presented to the membership at King's Cross at a meeting at 11 a.m. tomorrow morning and the membership will then decide uh, what to do with regards to our requests. But only the two Aslef men at today's hearing are legally bound by the undertakings. Their branch committee decided later, with a hint of defiance, to make no recommendation on lifting the blacking. So victory for the Sun Group is very much in doubt. To combat the blacking as well as the strikes, they've been sending their papers by road and air. As left national officials, equally opposed to the unofficial action at King's Cross, now fear that the men there could listen politely to the result of today's hearing and then vote to continue the ban. Tomorrow's union meeting is expected to cause some disruption to mid-morning services at King's Cross, but British Rail say otherwise they hope services will be more or less normal. There were, of course, no trains at all today because ASLEF were staging their second Sunday strike. British Rail and the National Union of Railway Men again called for the dispute to go to arbitration, but there's no news of any talks. The chairman of British Steel, Ian McGregor, has confirmed that he's been acting as a go-between in a plan for his former company in America to take over the closed aluminium smelter at Invergordon. Mr McGregor said the workers' sit-in would make it difficult, but a workers' spokesman said he hoped a potential buyer would remember their previous excellent record at the works. Thousands of nurses and midwives held a rally in Trafalgar Square in London this afternoon in pursuit of a big pay rise. They want an increase of 12%, but think they may be offered only 4%. The Royal College of Nursing say that some nurses now find it difficult to make ends meet. MPs from all the main parties turned up to address the rally, but Tory MP Tom Benyon got the loudest reception when he urged moderation. The woman in the controversial Glasgow rape case is to go ahead with a private prosecution of her alleged attackers. Prosecution against three youths alleged to have raped the woman was dropped because the Crown uh, considered she was not well enough to give evidence. Her solicitor said tonight that he intends to start preliminary proceedings tomorrow. A policeman who was found dead in his gas-filled house near Doncaster today was due to appear in court accused of rape. Detective Constable George Hall had been suspended on full pay. When his brother tried to turn off the gas supply, there was an explosion which wrecked the house and injured the brother. And Suffolk police are tonight looking for a man who raped a girl of 17 after she'd accepted a lift on her way home from a party. The attack near Bury St Edmunds took place only a few miles from where another girl hitchhiker was raped last year. Her attacker was subsequently fined in a case which caused a national outcry. In Northern Ireland, the security forces are investigating a shooting in which a man, apparently unarmed, was shot dead by a UDR patrol in Armagh early today. 21-year-old Tony Harker was shot soon after a series of firebomb explosions. Brian Barron reports.
The UDR were on full alert after several firebomb explosions at a builder's yard. A patrol saw two men acting suspiciously near this supermarket. When one appeared to draw a gun, UDR soldiers fired twice, killing Tony Harker. Police say no gun was found. Harker's sister admits he was on bail on petrol bomb charges. He wasn't armed, and I don't think he should have been shot dead. I think that they could have taken him alive prisoner and took him into the barracks. They didn't have to shoot him. Has your brother ever been in trouble before? Yes, he has, and he's been harassed a lot by police and army, UDR and all. What sort of trouble has he been in? Oh, he's been different things, rioting and all this business. The shooting coincides with the launching of this leaflet by a new organisation called Silent Too Long, drawing attention to the number of Catholics killed by the security forces and loyalist paramilitary groups. Over 600 deaths are claimed since 1969. However, it can also be seen as a hasty attempt to match recent loyalist propaganda about provisional IRA murders. American investigators are trying to find out why a DC-10 airliner skidded off a runway into Boston Harbor last night. The plane's nose section came almost completely off as it crashed into the harbor. There were more than 200 people on board, but nobody was seriously hurt. At first, it was thought ice on the runway caused the skid, but the airport says there was no ice at the time. Martin Bell reports. The DC-10 was on a flight from Oakland, California. It landed at Boston Airport in bad weather, fog and freezing rain, and got down safely, but ran out of control near the end of the runway. It hit a safety barrier, which all but severed the cockpit from the passenger cabin. The plane then skidded into Boston Harbor and ended in two feet of water. The passengers who escaped through the rear doors had to wade waist deep in the water to get to safety. It was not the tragedy that friends and relatives waiting in the airport terminal had feared at first. The flight crew got everyone out. 23 people were taken to hospital for treatment, mostly for shock, but none of them was seriously hurt. Among those who spoke afterwards of the ordeal was the mother of a small baby. We overshot the runway, and I saw that we weren't stopping. We hit ice, and um, the pilot did what he could. I don't think he anticipated the ice. And then the front of the plane went down into the water, and it, it cut off. The whole front of the plane disappeared. The accident at Boston followed by only 10 days. The Air Florida crash in Washington, both apparently caused by the bad weather. On the eve of a major speech by Poland's military ruler, General Jaruzelski, the head of the country's Catholic Church has appealed for dialogue and tolerance. In a sermon broadcast on Polish radio, Archbishop Glemp appealed for unity, compelled to, he said, by voices full of pain and distress. Tomorrow, General Jaruzelski will make his first speech since military rule was imposed. It's expected he'll announce some relaxation of martial law. Italian police are no nearer finding James Dozier, the American army general kidnapped five weeks ago. But the huge search mounted for the Red Brigade's terrorists who took him is yielding other results. The police have put up roadblocks and used helicopters and cars in town and country. No sign of the NATO general, but at least a hundred common criminals, hundreds of illegal weapons and 65 stolen cars have found their way into police custody. Most of the big operation has been going on in the north of the country where the general was kidnapped, and the search goes on. Not everybody, though, is under suspicion. The Austrian skier Franz Klammer suffered a cruel blow in today's rerun of the World Cup downhill at Wengen. Yesterday, Klammer was the clear leader in the famous Lauberhorn downhill when it was abandoned because of fog. But today he was slowed by fresh snow and could only come forth behind his compatriot Hati Weiratha, who was the world champion last year. David Vine, the commentator. Second here to Tony Bergler last year. Tight on the S, they're all getting a good line through there. Down through the place where Muller fell last year. And must be there, surely. 204, 43 is, he's in by half a second. So, the defending World Cup downhill champion, with a victory in Kitzbühel, leads here at Fengen on the Laberhorn. It's life. And that's all from the newsroom for this weekend. From me, good night.